Dr. Kenyon, what first interested you in the study of biological origins? Well, I uh, have had a long-standing interest in uh, the life sciences. I mean, I this began back in uh, high school, and when I got to college, um, I studied physics as an undergraduate, but um, we had the Darwin Centennial uh, in 1959, and uh, that's piqued my interest in the origin topic, seeing all of these people, uh, great people, uh, talking about this subject. So it had an influence on what I did in, uh, in graduate school. So I went to Stanford and worked on uh, uh, a problem related to the origin of uh, first life, and uh, I've worked on it uh, since that time. So. What is the relationship between Darwinism and the origin of life? Well, Darwin, of course, provided the, the general framework for gradual development uh, in complexity of, uh, of systems, and um, uh, that I sort of think of as the 19th century great issue in biology, and then in the 20th century we have many uh, big problems, but uh, we have the chemical evolution studies uh, sort of uh, coming in the 20th century, uh, taking inspiration from Darwin's uh, uh, views about uh, the development of species, just projecting some of the uh, general concepts back into the pre-life period and talking about uh, the development of chemical systems rather than uh, species of organism. And the long time spans uh, that Darwin required uh, seemed, were very consistent with uh, the need for huge millions of, tens of millions of years for, um, for any kind of chemical evolutionary development of cells. So. What was your viewpoint on Darwinism and the origin of life when you wrote Biochemical Predestination? Well, I uh, was very much uh, a Darwinist uh, at that time, or neo-Darwinist, I guess we would say. I was fully persuaded that uh, his views about um, the development of species were correct. And um, I also uh, was uh, um, generally in support of um, the ideas of Oparin on the origin of first life. And Oparin took inspiration from Darwin's uh, uh, earlier work. And so I, would, I guess I would say I was a convinced uh, neo-Darwinist and, uh, and a chemical evolutionist. How have your views changed since you wrote Biochemical Predestination? Well, it, uh, over a period of years, uh, when I was involved in teaching uh, um, courses here uh, at San Francisco State on the uh, origin of life and uh, on the topic of evolution, um, it became uh, increasingly difficult for me to um, to provide um, examples of of uh, actually observed evolutionary change for my students. Um, uh, difficult to find uh, transition fossil series documented uh, in the literature that I could uh, uh, back up my lectures with and supplement the textbook material with, and um, I think that was one of the main factors that led me to begin to question whether or not this. Um, general um, uh, viewpoint about uh, origins uh, might not be correct. Um, and uh, then there was the work on, that I was involved in my own research work on origin of first life, and um, as time went on there, I began to be more aware of some of the, uh, the, the problems uh, involved, uh, the question of oxygen in the primitive atmosphere, the question of origin of genetic information. Um, looked in increasingly problematical to me. So I think things added up to uh, uh, a time for a critical re-examination. Uh, oh, this would be back in 15 years ago or so when I uh, really uh, made an effort to look at the, all of the criticism that uh, uh, was uh, being leveled at, at uh, evolutionary theory. Actually, some students um, uh, brought me a book uh, by A. E. Wilder Smith called The Creation of Life, A Cybernetic Approach to Ev Evolution, um, in which uh, my own uh, work with uh, Gary Steinman, Biochemical Predestination, was critiqued. And uh, I thought I could easily refute this uh, refutation of my work, and so I said, well, I'll take the summer to look at this material. It looks very interesting. Uh, by the time the summer was over, I had decided pretty much that I could not refute this criticism. Um, a number of 
lines of argument that we had not uh, anticipated, had not included in our earlier work, were brought up by Wilder Smith, and uh, and he had some he had something very uh, powerful indeed to as a challenge to uh, to my earlier views. Do many of your colleagues support your new position? Well, most of my colleagues, um, I would have to say, the majority of them are are not in support of, uh, of my views on origins, my new views on, on origin, first life, and, and uh, on evolution. Um, there are some of those who uh, are uh, also not in support of my uh, being able to uh, discuss these matters in, uh, in class. Um, there are a few who are sympathetic uh, to uh, an open and free uh, discussion of these matters, although not all of those are sympathetic to the to my views themselves. A couple are. Now, I'm not not the only one who, uh, uh, in the uh, science faculty here, who would uh, have views uh, like I do about origins. As to why there is this um, attitude on the part of the faculty, uh, I'm not sure that I could give a a quick answer. I mean, you have to ask them, of course. But uh, I think deeply ingrained habits of thought is a, is is a factor. Uh, when one has been uh, trained uh, to to uh, accept uh, and to really be only aware of uh, one particular explanation of origins, the Darwinian account and the standard ev chemical evolutionary material, uh, and not ever having read a single critical paper, or certainly not having read a single article defending intelligent design, uh, perhaps it's not surprising that uh, there would be this kind of uh, reluctance to to support this. I suspect that some of them may themselves suspect that a rather major uh, reorientation of thinking would follow if uh, they were to give serious consideration to to this to the literature on this subject, and have said, "Well, I just don't want to do that. Um, it, it, it's going to involve uh, something that I'm not prepared to do in the way of major uh, reassessment of uh, some parts of biology." Although much of I believe much of biology will will remain intact, they needn't worry <laughs> so much, but uh, uh, other than that, I can't, I mean, there are other things involved, surely, but I don't know what, what they would all be. What are the major strengths of neo-Darwinian theory? Well, I think the neo-Darwinian uh, theory can account for uh, uh, what I would consider to be relatively minor biological change. I think uh, it provides a an excellent explanation for microevolutionary change and for probably some degree of speciation as well. Um, for example, the production of sibling species in, in insects and, um, and other uh, examples where the species are fairly closely related to the parents. Um, I think that the uh, neo-Darwinian uh, explanation is pretty, uh, pretty sound. What are the major problems with neo-Darwinian theory? Well, I think that the theory is not able to do a very good job explaining um, more major uh, evolutionary changes that the, what we would call the macro-evolutionary level of change. Uh, just exactly where that level of change ought to be placed is a matter of some dispute, whether it's at the level of genera or at the level of families, or even higher at the level of orders, where you find the boundary between microevolution and macroevolution. There's some discussion about that, but I think that uh, the uh, neo-Darwinian uh, synthesis is, uh, uh, is not adequate to, to account for those more major uh, biological changes. Have any other scientists raised similar objections? Yes, we have the examples of uh, Richard Goldschmidt, uh, geneticist at uh, University of California at Berkeley, who some years ago did uh, uh, develop a line of thinking that uh, uh, to try and account for uh, macroevolutionary change involving rather major uh, and quick um, reorganization of the genome of species, of ancestral species, to give uh, uh, quick saltational uh, moves in evolutionary change. Um, he certainly uh, doubted that uh, the accumulation of microevolutionary change could be extrapolated uh, into the macroevolutionary realm. Uh, there have been others uh, among really major figures, the zoologist in uh, France, Pierre Grasset, 
has uh, written extensively about the limitations of the neo-Darwinian uh, mechanism for change and, and expressed many doubts along similar lines to uh, some of the things that Goldschmidt uh, has said. He doesn't think microevolutionary change can accumulate to, to give you uh, a new major uh, body plans. Most of Darwin's critics argued that many biological innovations could not possibly arise from a gradual accumulation of many small steps. How was Darwin able to overcome the criticism that incipient and intermediate stages are not advantageous? Well, this is an interesting puzzle historically. Um, yes, you're, it is true that these um, problems uh, in uh, the Darwinian uh, view were recognized by the critics right at the outset. And uh, so one does have this uh, problem of accounting for uh, a, a fairly rapid uh, uh, a change to Darwin's uh, point of view. Um, I'm not sure I can give anything like a complete explanation of that, but I would uh, mention the following. The, the uh, overall persuasiveness of the book, Origin of Species, is really very impressive uh, in the, in the the logic and the, the structure of the argument, I think, was most impressive, bringing together many different lines of um, evidence all to go together to, to give this picture of a naturalistic uh, alternative explanation of, or, of uh, origin of uh, species. After all, the, the belief at that time was, was uh, frankly, in special creation. And there was, a, I think, a, a, a desire on the part of many people working in science to find a a naturalistic explanation, but it had, it had to have a convincing uh, proposal for a mechanism for that change. And I think that uh, in, in, one would have to say that in spite of those difficulties recognized by some of the early critics, um, that uh, nonetheless the argument won the day. It, uh, it was uh, immensely uh, appealing to... Uh, now, you, you can go further and talk about sociological uh, uh, factors uh, in the uh, climate of opinion there in, uh, in Victorian England and about the idea of progress uh, and about the, uh, the business competition in business and, and the Darwinian uh, theory kind of uh, being attractive also from that point of view. But uh, I, I don't want to get in, I mean, that's not my field, but one could mention those other things too. Is it possible that natural selection actually prevents major evolutionary change from occurring, thus accounting for higher taxon level stasis? Yes, I think that uh, natural selection can be seen as having primarily a conservative role in, uh, in maintaining the integrity of the uh, genome of a given uh, species. I mean, we have, uh, we can distinguish various modes of natural selection. One of them uh, is, uh, is stabilizing selection, where you do, where you do have in every generation the, uh, the tendency to, to have early death or removal of the extremes of the population. And that, uh, that I think, is a very real phenomenon that, that uh, does contribute to the stability uh, in the long term. Are mutations a plausible source of novel genetic information? Well, I think the vast majority of mutations that we've actually seen and, and documented in the laboratory or in the, in the field uh, are harmful to the organism, or at the best, they are, uh, appear to be neutral, have uh, no influence one way or the other. The truly favorable mutations, the kind that you would need to accumulate literally by the hundreds in a single evolving lineage, we just don't observe. Um, in, either in the laboratory or in the field. So it's very difficult for me to see how we would have the production of enough favorable mutations um, uh, in the same evolving lineage uh, that would all complement one another to create new, um, new structure. Do most scientists agree with you? I think that uh, it's widely recognized that the um, observed mutations are uh, mostly harmful or possibly neutral. Um, I, I guess the hope is, I, I'm, the hope must be that, uh, that over long periods of time, uh, far longer than any human lifetime, obviously, over millions of years, you'd have the fortuitous occurrence of enough uh, favorable mutations, whilst the, um, the unfavorable ones would be weeded out so, uh, in every generation, and you just accumulate the, uh, the favorable ones. But I don't see that the, uh, the evidence that we have on, 
uh, related to actually known mutations is, uh, is very supportive of that, of that view. Darwin considered the fossil record to be the most serious objection to his theory. Has the situation changed since 1859? Well, the gaps uh, that Darwin was well aware of in the fossil record in, in his day um, have not been filled uh, by transition uh, fossils uh, in, in the interim since then. Uh, I believe that Darwin himself and uh, certainly Thomas Henry Huxley were very hopeful that future uh, paleontological research would, uh, would, would actually give many examples, many uh, good examples of transition series of fossils. Uh, the fact that that has not occurred, where the number of known fossil specimens has increased, oh, at least tenfold, maybe, maybe uh, uh, 20, 30 fold or so, uh, the gaps are even more noticeable uh, than they were in Darwin's day. This has been acknowledged by uh, any number of paleontologists. Uh, David Raup has pointed this out. Uh, uh, that the gaps are, are sharper uh, now, appear to be sharper now, in spite of the fact that we have something over a quarter of a million different species represented in the fossil record, and we can find no series of finely graduated fossils that link one major uh, living type of living organism to another. How large a gap is there between single-celled organisms and the numerous phyla which appear in the Cambrian explosion? What evidence is there for the transitional forms leading to the origin of the phyla? Well, I think it's an enormous gap because in the Precambrian, uh, what we find in the fossil record are only scattered uh, examples of bacterial fossils, a few protistin organisms. Um, we find some soft-bodied invertebrates uh, in a couple of uh, locations around the world, but the general picture is one of uh, a paucity of uh, fossil uh, data. And then all of a sudden, in the uh, early years of the Cambrian, we find uh, 40, 50 phyla or so um, that uh, appear just to sort of explode on the scene. And I would say that the, uh, we, we really have no ancestral sequence in the late Precambrian pre that leads up to any of those uh, individual uh, new phyla that appear. So it is a very great problem to, to answer. What are the most plausible explanations for the lack of transitional forms in the fossil record? Well, uh, the punctuated equilibrium theory, of course, attempts to uh, explain the uh, lack of transition fossils on the view that, um, that most um, organisms in the past, most lineages, were, were not undergoing uh, uh, noticeable evolutionary change, i.e., they were in stasis. And, um, that the species appear uh, rather suddenly in the fossil record, remain in stasis, and then, and, and then disappear. Um, they also, uh, the equilibrium, the genetic equilibrium, can be uh, interrupted by, by quick bursts of rapid evolutionary change happening in, in quite small populations, too small to have any probability, it is claimed, of leaving um, um, fossil evidence of the transition having occurred. So the punctuated equilibrium idea is an attempt to deal with the problem of gaps, but a most interesting feature of that idea is that it, it's a theory that predicts the absence of, of its own documenting evidence. And just on grounds of um, criteria for, for soundness of scientific ideas, I find this uh, punctuated equilibrium proposal um, lacking because uh, uh, we want to have um, uh, a theory that actually uh, predicts uh, that there would be some kind of documenting trace of the transitions uh, among forms if, in fact, there was physical uh, relationship among the forms. I, I really think in the present state of the evidence that a more plausible interpretation of the data, a, a, a more conservative interpretation, a less speculative one, would be to say that the transitions did not happen in history. Now, of course, we won't be sure uh, that this is a, a, a supportable idea until careful probability calculations are done um, based on the, um, the size of a rapidly evolving uh, population and the probability of catching a fossil from that uh, population over a given time span. Um, and uh, We need to have those calculations carefully done before we're able to say that the, uh, on the punctuated equilibrium model we do not expect to find transition fossils. 
Stephen Jay Gould wrote of the possible return of Goldschmidt's hopeful monsters. Why haven't they returned? Well, I think it was a, an interesting suggestion that maybe we would have to go back and, uh, and use uh, this idea of Goldschmidt to, uh, to account for these apparent big jumps in, uh, in, uh, in the transitions that we see in the fossil record. I think one of the reasons why the idea has not come back is lack of a uh, believable genetic mechanism uh, for a, such a large uh, reorganization of the genome so that you can go from type organism type A to organism type B in essentially one step or a, sh a small number of generational steps. Uh, I don't, we just don't know how the genome could reorganize uh, so quickly and so massively. Uh, someday maybe somebody will have a proposal there, but at the moment... Uh, and if you don't, if you don't have a plausible mechanism for something, uh, for a, uh, to back up a concept, uh, that's often been the case that the concept itself is not entertained very long. So. Can microevolution be extrapolated to account for macroevolution? I don't think so. I think that uh, microevolution can certainly uh, produce, uh, well, as the name indicates, relatively minor. Uh, variations within a given species, but I don't uh, see any indication uh, that it can ever uh, accumulate enough genetic change to cross even the species bar barrier, let alone uh, getting to higher ta taxonomic groups. Uh. What are the best examples of speciation? Well, I would say um, that the sibling species among uh, various insect populations that we see, or for example, fruit fly uh, populations in the wild, we may see f a swarm of 40, 50 uh, very closely related species uh, living in the same general geographic uh, uh, area. And I think that uh, one could certainly conclude that, uh, that uh, all fo of these species uh, might have come uh, from uh, a single ancestral uh, uh, species. Uh, I think we have uh, a, a number of examples in the uh, f uh, flowering plants um, where we uh, can bring in the phenomenon of polyploidy, autopolyploidy or allopolyploidy. In the cord grasses, for example, uh, we probably have some actually documented cases just in the last, uh, in this century, of, new, of uh, bona fide new species arising from, from old ones. Um, uh, there are scattered examples like this, some rabbits off the coast of uh, Portugal uh, introduced there uh, 400 years ago now seem to be a different species with pretty continuous observation in between. Uh, so uh, those are among the more convincing instances of speciation, I think. Does speciation constitute macroevolution? Well, I, I think uh, to answer that, we need to talk about how different the ancestral uh, species is from the uh, offspring uh, species. And if we're talking, again, about the sibling species of insect, where you have very little uh, difference in genetic information, probably no net increase in genetic information, uh, then I would say surely not an example of macroevolution. What mechanisms account for the natural phenomenon of stasis? Well, I think that uh, stabilizing natural selection would certainly be um, a factor in uh, maintaining the stasis of a, of a lineage. Um, there may be limits to how much a genome can vary and stay viable. Um, and that would be another factor in, uh, in maintaining stasis. Um, it may be possible for uh, a genome to um, if we can put it this way, to adjust um, to a, a wider range of environmental changes than we've previously thought possible and still remain the same functioning genome. Uh, as, I mean, after all, uh, you've got to go through many millions of years uh, to, uh, taking the fossil data for how long some of these uh, periods of stasis can last. And presumably, in some, you have some environmental uh, changes during those times, although maybe it's been generally fairly quiet. but. So the genome is probably pretty uh, capable of adapting to maybe a fairly wide range of uh, environmental changes. There may also be um, some uh, con constraints along the lines of uh, other organisms in the uh, surrounding uh, area occupying uh, 
uh, the ecological niches, and so no room for uh, evolutionary development into those niches. That's some of the things that might uh, go into an explanation. But I think more work needs to be done on this issue. I think this is a, a good topic for, for future research. Is it possible that natural processes do not exist which can overcome what Gould has called the ordinary rules of stability? I think it is possible that um, natural processes do not exist that could overcome the stability, at least uh, to carry one species into a substantially different one. Of course, you'd have to define what you mean by substantial, but I'm not talking about sibling species here. I'm talking about what we would consider to be macroevolutionary uh, change. Yes, I, I, I. I think we, have to, we would have to admit that uh, the possibility exists that there are not uh, natural processes that could overcome this, uh, this barrier. Neo-Darwinian theory predicts that an increasing diversity of species should precede the origin of new phyla. How can the theory account for the fact that virtually all of the major phyla appear abruptly in the fossil record before any significant diversity appears? I think this is a great difficulty for the neo-Darwinian picture because um, it is correct that the, the, the major disparity is already in place uh, uh, before we go too far into the Cambrian. And uh, it is true that uh, the higher tax, uh, um, uh, let's say the, the classes and so on, uh, are uh, originating fairly early in the, in the sequence and not later as you'd expect on the, on the uh, neo-Darwinian uh, uh, picture. So um, I think that we've got a major area of, of difficulty that needs to be carefully addressed by, uh, well, by the neo-Darwinians. Is the theory of evolution potentially falsifiable? What evidence might falsify it? Well, it's a very flexible theory. Um, it seems to me that it can uh, account for uh, many, if not virtually every, observation that one could make in nature. Some sort of story about the uh, evolutionary origin can be proposed, and many have been proposed. Um, I think I would have to conclude that, uh, that, that no, this is uh, probably not going to be um, uh, uh, falsifiable, not in the ordinary sense of falsifying a theory in other areas of science where you can do a crucial experiment and get a clear result and, and, the res and, and then you must accept that the hypothesis is uh, false. Uh, we're dealing with a historical uh, scientific proposal here and it just is not um, uh, possible in the same way as in the other sciences to uh, to clearly uh, falsify the notion. But I think that, the, so I would say largely non-falsifiable. It, it does appear to me to be a peculiar difficulty of, of neo-Darwinism, though. It seems to be almost immune to, uh, to any kind of uh, observation that could not somehow be uh, incorporated into its, uh, into its framework. Is it possible that natural processes are insufficient to account for the origin of all biological information. Yes, and I'm wondering whether it's possible for natural processes to account for the origin of any biologic information. Um, but, but certainly uh, this, uh, the major increase in uh, biological information proposed in the general theory of evolution, I, I, I really do not think we have as yet seen any convincing proposal of a natural mechanism for adding uh, genetic information. Yeah, from the very beginning of the uh, history of organisms, how you even go from the, uh, from the monorins to, uh, to something like a protistin, um, and, and certainly all the way up through the higher tax, uh, I just don't see that we have such a, uh, an explanation now. Why is an intelligent design or creationist interpretation of the scientific data not acceptable to many scientists? Well, I think we have here an example of, um, again, the, uh, the deeply ingrained habits of thought uh, that are connected with uh, 
with Darwinism and neo-Darwinism and this commitment to uh, uh, philosophical naturalism that the, the only permissible uh, explanations in science are those that involve uh, observable and testable natural processes. And um, when you move into the area of intelligent design, although you argue to intelligent design through a, a, a dense field, if you will, of empirical data, and it's only after uh, extended encounter with those data that you come out at the end with an intelligent design conclusion, nevertheless, it makes many scientists uneasy because uh, this is a, a thought of, this causal causation, intelligent causation, as ultimately untestable by the uh, traditional methods of, uh, of science. So if you define science as, as, as um, excluding the possibility of intelligent cause at the outset, then any proposal that uh, is made, however many data back it, is uh, ruled out of court uh, as from the beginning. So. Does academic freedom allow you to discuss the difficulties of Darwinism and scientific naturalism? If not, why is Darwinism and naturalism protected from criticism? Well, ideally, academic freedom should allow one to discuss uh, the difficulties not only of Darwinism, but of any scientific theory. Uh, it's been the tradition uh, through the long history of uh, science in, in Western culture to, to proceed by precisely by a comparison and a contrasting of, uh, of major opposing views in order to see which one is the better view. And this uh, um, uh, policy or procedure about the examination of alternative views can certainly be seen in the early Greek philosophers. I mean, you have Plato and Aristotle. Um, what was a platonic dialogue but uh, a, a comparison of a variety of different opinions with, and looked at from every angle to see which one held up against careful scrutiny and to find the best um, one out of the field. Aristotle always mentions all the other theories, uh, and then he finally winds up stating his own. And then, but the tradition has always been the, com the comparison, the, the competition of ideas, the, the vigorous debate. And, but uh, unfortunately now, in our current climate in, in uh, universities and colleges, uh, we do not have, generally speaking, um, the uh, freedom to, um, I'm talking about public institutions now, the, um, the freedom to openly criticize um, the Darwinian view, to bring up uh, arguments in support of alternative, alternative interpretations, in spite of the fact that professional biologists f recognize many of, the, of these difficulties. Why should this be so? It may have uh, something to do with uh, cultural dominance. It may be an issue of power. Um, it, um, in order to uh, allow an equal voice to the intelligent design um, uh, position, uh, one has got to share the stage with, uh, with a view that uh, may be anathema to, um, uh, to the um, scientific establishment. And, uh, and yet to do this would, would I think, greatly assist uh, the, the progress of, um, of research on this, uh, this vital area of origins, um, which after all is, is, a, is a most difficult problem and could, could benefit from, 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 uh, in, from an open and vigorous uh, debate. And students would also, uh, university students would greatly benefit from seeing uh, some of the disputes, not all of the minor disputes that go on among professionals, but, but the fact that there are these major alternative views that are now being seriously discussed by more and more scientists. How should Darwinism be taught in light of the California science framework, which states that nothing in science or in any other field of knowledge shall be taught dogmatically? Well, not dogmatically, obviously. I think uh, what, what, what we should have there is an open discussion of uh, the strengths as well as the weaknesses of the Darwinian interpretation of the data, and then we should bring in other major alternative uh, views. Um, I think if we restrict the discussion to a single uh, version of uh, the uh, origins uh, explanation, um, we are doing a disservice to the students and we're holding back uh, progress uh, in the field. And uh, it's just unnecessary to do that. And a debate could be very, uh, very exciting to, uh, to open that up.
What do you mean by your statement that perhaps scientism is more widespread than we like to think? Well, with the increasing uh, recognition of problems in uh, both the theory of chemical evolution, especially in the last 20 years, I would say, and in the neo-Darwinian picture, um, one has to wonder why there is this uh, tendency to uh, shun criticism and shun debate on this issue, when every other topic that you can think of in a, in a university setting is uh, pretty openly discussed and views are, uh, radically different views are, are entertained. Um, and so maybe the uh, reluctance to, to, uh, to entertain the criticism has uh, is an indication that uh, scientism, um, i.e. The, the belief that uh, the uh, scientific uh, method defined in a certain way can really explain all issues and tackle all problems, um, is perhaps even more deeply ingrained than uh, we would have thought. Um, and, uh, and so I think that goes to explain uh, uh, some of this great reluctance, that there is this commitment to scientism and you could, in the closely related uh, idea of uh, philosophical uh, naturalism.